YouTube, welcome back to my channel. It's your boy D Dyson. So I definitely uh just a day late and a dollar short, but we're definitely going to get into Andor episode four, the breakdown, Star Wars Easter eggs, and details that we missed from the kings and queens of the breakdown. New rock stars. Let's check this out. Welcome back to New Rock Stars. I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Star Wars Andor Episode 4, my favorite episode yet of this series, because it drops us into the middle of a rebel mission no one wants us on, and makes us host a space Nazi Senate dinner party we don't want to host. Star Wars! You know, some of those other Star Wars content creators may feel dismayed by the low numbers covering this show, but I can hear the reckoning taps out there. The spark that ignites the flame. I have hope. Hope that more and more people are going to find out how great this show is. So in the meantime, let's break down this episode frame by frame. Everything you missed in it because you know what? These Andor Easter eggs are a bit harder to spot, and I got you covered. And this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. We'll give you some more info on them in just a moment. Nicholas Bertel's opening music hits way harder for episode four with this intense percussion. Because now we are off of the planet Ferrix, and Cassian Andor has joined the Sprint of the Rebellion. Luthen sets the coordinates for the planet Aldani. Calculations complete. Yes, the computer voice of Luthen's Fondor Hallcraft is the voice actor and sound designer David W. Collins, who's worked on a ton of Star Wars titles over the years, but I don't think he's credited on this. Much bullshit. Cassian says, Been in a Fondor Hallcraft. I've flown them. Never seen one do that. Yeah, so hyperspace travel requires hyperdrives powered by molecular displacement. Not every ship has a hyperdrive, especially smaller ones, because they're pretty huge. The fact that Luthen has somehow been able to install one of these on this smaller local vessel is likely how this trickster has been able to travel planet to planet undetected. Luthen tells Cassian that there's really no point in going alone because we're dealing with the Empire here. I'll use the same rope to hang you, whether it's for a plasma coil or 20 million credits. Yes, plasma coils are parts used by the Incom Corporation, the company that builds X Wings. Cassian speculates who Luthen is. Alliance, Sep, Guerrilla, Partisan Front, one of them. Isn't it all the same? Alliance, of course, referring to Rebel Alliance, Sep, to Separatist in the Clone Wars era. Guerrilla and Partisan Front referred to Saw Gerrera's faction of rebels with more terroristic tactics. Now, no doubt that you've heard about Raid Shadow Legends from us before. The New Rockstar's crew can't get enough of it. Raid is a console-sized gaming experience that fits in your pocket, but the game itself is huge. There are over 600 champions blessed with unique skills to choose from and millions of combinations to battle with. I can't list them all here, but what I can do is tell you who the three most badass champions are at the moment. Brachus the Shifter gets up there for the sake of werewolfiness, followed by Krila Witch Arm for the sake of witch arminess, and my number one badass champion, Sissia Flame Tongue, for the sake of being a fire demon with a giant sword. This month, you can take your badass champions into a brutal new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress. Beat the Iron Twins and you'll be able to awaken your champions. Awakening lets you choose a blessing that transforms how you battle. It adds a ton of depth and strategy, giving you even more options for how to to badassly battle your way through raid. Also, Ultimate Death Knight is finally here. Everyone can get him for free just by logging in. All you gotta do is log in and play raid for seven days between now and October 27th. Whether you're new to raid or a grizzled veteran, use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free items so that you can instantly level your new strongest champion all the way to level 50, five star ascension. But if you are new to raid, click the link in the description or scan the QR code here on screen and you'll get unique bonuses for $30. You'll get a free epic champion, Aina, 200,000 silver, one energy refill, and one XP boost, and one ancient shard. You can collect all your goodies just by hitting the treasure icon right here. And these bonuses are only available for the next 30 days and only for new players. Just head to your inbox to claim everything. But first, download Raid by clicking the link below. There's never been a better time to get started. Cassian talks about his background. I fought in Mimban when I was 16. And who did it turn out we were fighting? ourselves. Yes, Memban is a bog planet, originally created for the 1977 Star Wars film and used in the 1978 novel Splinter of the Mind's Eye by Alan Dean Foster, one of the earliest and best works of Star Wars expanded universe fiction. Memban was mentioned in Clone Wars and considered for Rogue One before Jedha replaced it as a setting and finally shown in live action in Solo, A Star Wars Story, where Han Solo fought in the Battle of Memban as an Imperial Infantry Cadet. Memban is where Han first met Chewbacca. So could Cassian have met Han or Chewie on Memban? Maybe, but Luthen calls out that Cassian was actually a cook and maybe a deserter. You were on the ground in Mimban for six months. You came in as a cook. You lived because you ran. 
Cassian and Luthen say they were fighting themselves on Mimban. During the Empire, the campaign was actually waged against the Mimbanese Liberation Army, who was originally aided by the Republic clone troopers during the Clone Wars. So similar to United States war efforts in places like Afghanistan, the enemy are the kind of freedom fighters. Our side originally aided against a different enemy. So in a way, fighting ourselves, or at least fighting our own weapons. And again, by knowing that Cassian was a cook on Mimban, Luthen reveals how much homework he has done on this guy and how really that Starpath unit was a kind of test for a new recruit. I didn't risk my ass for the Starpath unit. I came for you. And Luthen reveals the score. The quarterly payroll for an entire Imperial sector. A smart plan. Cut the Empire's ability to pay their forces. Hit them in their wallets. Onto Coruscant. Its cityscape surface lit up from the space, but a closer look at the buildings show that the urban setting is colder, grayer, more muted in color tone than when we saw it in Revenge of the Sith and recently in Obi-Wan Kenobi flashbacks. Dedra Miro approaches the Imperial Security Bureau, the Empire's intelligence gathering sector. Major Partagaz is their superior, played amazingly by Anton Lesser, Kyburn from Game of Thrones, Supervisor Grandi reports, With the next quarter's detention estimates expected to increase across the Ryloth sector, any further erosion in local authority may require an increase in our Black Line budget. Yes, Ryloth is home to the Twi'lek species, including the Syndulla family. And nine years before this, Cham Syndulla plotted to kill Darth Sidious and Darth Vader on the planet Ryloth and of course failed. This led to an increased Imperial presence on Ryloth that will lead to Hera Syndulla embarking on her rebel path and pilot leading the ghost rebels. Meanwhile, Legret reports that mining has resumed on the occupied lands of Arvala 6. Arvala 7 is the name of the desert planet in the same system from season one of The Mandalorian. This is where Din Djarin finds Grogu from a gang of Nikdos. Partagaz stands up and lectures that the ISV mission statement is actually wrong. Security is an illusion. You want security? Call the Navy. We are healthcare providers. We treat sickness, whether they arise from within or have come from the outside. Yes, Anton Lesser breathlessly zips through all of his lines, max efficiency, as if it's a sin to waste any time or effort when you're on the Empire's clock. His comparison to their work as treating disease recalls the Grand Inquisitor's philosophy about the Jedi. But the Jedi code is like an itch. He cannot help it. But whereas the Grand Inquisitor simplifies this ill as a compulsion that must be stamped out, Partagaz disturbingly views all dissent as a kind of disorder that's treatable with the right medicine, which forces us to ask, what's creepier, an extermination and a purge, or a kind of enslavement and brainwashing? Blevin reports the latest drama from Ferrix and Morlana 1 that we saw in the first three episodes and mentions the recovered Imperial Starpath unit, which breaks out Dedra Miro because that's her jurisdiction. She's wondering, how did that even get in their hands? Partagaz asks Young about traffic to the Avrion sector. Proactive measures, sir. There's an increase in construction shipments going to Scarif, sir. I asked Scarif. Really the closest thing we've gotten so far to Star Wars major events continuity. Scarif, you should know, is where the Empire moved construction of the Death Star from Geonosis four years prior under the supervision of director Orson Krennic. And while I don't need cameos from Vader or Palpatine or even Tarkin on this series, I'd love me some Ben Mendelsohn Krennic showing up, please. Onto the planet Aldani. This is actually shot in the real world Scottish Highlands, the gorgeous green hills near the Krokan Dam and its power station. It's an actual dam. You can go visit it. Cassian chooses the name Clem as his alias, which was the name of Marva's partner, and we think Cassian's foster dad who was hung on the street in Ferrix. Luthen gives Cassian a down payment. It's a quality signet. Blue Kyber, Skystone, the ancient world celebrates the uprising against the Rakatan invaders. So Kyber crystals are, of course, the energy crystals from Ilum and other places that are used to power lightsabers. But Luthen says this is a Kuwati signet. Kuwati refers to an ancient merchant family from Kuat, a core world run by a matriarchal society. They kind of refer to themselves by the collective pronoun of we. Much of what we know about Kuat has until now been considered legends, non-canonical, from titles like the Old Republic stories ever since the 2015 Disney buyout. But lately, Star Wars titles have begun to recanonize certain legends elements. This really started with Thrawn in Star Wars Rebels, one of the coolest characters from the legend stories, and it's continued on in these Star Wars Disney Plus shows with things like the Witches of Dathomir mentioned in Boba Fett. Similarly, the Rakatans were created for the Knights of the Old Republic game and were later established as the original creators of hyperdrive technology. They were an ancient race of conquerors who were wiped out by the Republic over the ages. So with this one little crystal, Andor just brought back into Star Wars canon huge sections of Star Wars lore. I feel like Tony Gilroy probably just asked Pablo Hidalgo to write a story behind this crystal and Pablo was like, uh, uh, yes, please. Luthen tells Vel Sartha, leader of this mission, that Clem is joining the team whether she likes it or not. And he starts out nice, but I love how he loses his patience with her. We'll take him in and lie about how it's come to pass. You plug him in as a replacement for anyone who goes down along the way. In the next three days, if for any reason- Look at me! You wanted to lead! This is what it comes to. 
Luthen is clearly desperate for this mission to succeed and for Cassian to be a part of it. They just do such a good job in this episode establishing the stakes of this mission as a painfully arranged, timing-sensitive plot with a lot of moving parts, as if there's a number of off-screen buffins who died to give us this information and the window is about to close. Now you notice Cassian has now shaved his beard using the blade but leaving a sexy length of stubble. Now remember, since his mugshot was clean shaven, I assume he's just worried about the recent looks he got on Ferrix and I'm sure it has nothing to do with the actor needing different facial hair when they shot the Scotland stuff. Imperial inspectors escort away the Primor folks and one has to clear their trash? Including a carton of what I assume contains some blue ramen into a bin. Seriously, what is wrong with these people for leaving their workspaces a mess like that? Blevin reprimands Cyril Karn, Linus Mosk, and Chief Hine. Now before we mention how Karn tailored his uniform, you can see how there's some orange trim around the edge that aren't on the uniforms of the other two. And standing next to Hine, you can see how Hine's company badge is sewn on crooked. Blevin tells Karn, You've rung the final bell on corporate independence. As of this morning, the Milana system is under permanent imperial authority. Rung the final bell, especially cutting as it recalls the time grappler bell on Ferrix, the temporal epicenter of the town, and the root of how they all clanged on metal to communicate their grassroots reckoning. Vel talks about Luthen. He is something we will never discuss. When we get to camp, we're going to tell them this was my idea and we've been planning it all the while. We never mention him. Now, I assume this is a form of deniability among the rebel factions in order to protect Luthen in case any of the rebels get captured or if they flip. But this also feels a little personal between Bell and Luthen, like they might have a history. Maybe she is his daughter. She has the same hair color and the same frosty blue eyes after all. Patrolling TIE fighters buzz past. <laughs> Their iconic engine scream is dampened at first, but then roars as they cross over the ridge. I love the sound design and everything Lucasfilm. Dedra reads about the Starpath unit in the report. Ensign retrieved a sealed Imperial NS9 Starpath unit from the site. That is our box from Steergard. Has to be. Yeah, Luthen said that the Starpath unit had been on Steerguard, so there is more to the story of how it was stolen and who Luthen's Steerguard contact might be. Despite the muted color tone of all this, Dedra keeps a small bonsai-like tree in her office. Maybe a sign that there might be some goodness in her that we have yet to see. Luthen opens a hidden compartment on his ship where he changes into his wardrobe, including a wig, some beautiful purple clothes, and rings on each finger. Stellan's guards guard just takes his great beat to emotionally reset himself. Tony Gilroy said Stellan told him it was all in the hands, and he could see that specific hand gesture that he mentioned in the interview here, which he drops and magically his character melts away. Bell's team includes Karis Nemec, Alex Lothar from the Shut Up and Dance episode of Black Mirror and The End of the F***ing World on Netflix, and Arvel Skeen, actor Ima Moss Backrock, Richie from The Bear. Skeen catches Nemec sleeping. You ride with Mossy, Garbage, Saul Guerrero, all asleep on watch, they're gonna put your head on a pike for a laugh. Yeah, he mentioned Saw Gerrera there, the leader of the Rebel Partisans, our favorite from Rogue One, who will appear in a future episode. The others on the team include Terraman Barcona and Sinta Kaz. They're posing as shepherds and they keep a pen of sheep with horns curved like bantha horns and several of these horns per sheep. <laughs> it's so exhausted to count all the sheep stuff. Did my yawn make you yawn? I bet, I bet some of you yawned, didn't you? Cyril Karn lands at a spaceport where the announcer says over the PA, Tell Gordo Travel is a shipping company from the Star Wars role-playing game. Hosnian Prime, of course, the core world that will later become the capital for the New Republic until the First Order makes it go boom boom in The Force Awakens. Plexus was a sector also mentioned in the role-playing games. And Euphorus Major was a planet mentioned in a junior novel companion book to Star Wars Rebels. So Cyril's home world must be one of these three. Cyril takes the elevator down since the spaceport in the metro would be on the top levels of the cityscape and the living quarters would be lower and lower further down. But it also just mirrors how this guy is pretty much rock bottom in his career. His mother, Edie Slash, him and takes him in. She's played by actress Catherine Hunter, Fig from the Order of the Phoenix, and played the witches in the tragedy of Macbeth last year. Senator Mon Mothma visits Luthen's store, Genevieve O'Reilly returning from Rogue One after first playing the role in a Revenge of the Sith deleted scene. Of course, the character first played by Caroline Blackiston in Return of the Jedi. This store is an intricate revolving door. This whole area is just bright and strolled by these rich women, making it seem like Coruscant's Rodeo Drive. Luthen tells Mon Mothma, Free your mind, Senator. This is a place where time stands still. It's hard being surrounded with this much history and not be humbled by the insignificance of our daily anxiety. We often refer to the gallery as Coruscant's unofficial temple of patience. So yeah, in addition to being a front for rebel activity, this also might be Luthen's way of holding on to the past in an era when the Empire would want to tear down all other vestiges of culture, as they did with the Jedi Temple. Now in this shop is a Keldor breathing apparatus, much like the one worn by Jedi Master Plo Koon. Who knows, maybe the same one. Make me wonder, Luthen, are you really gathering trophies from dead Jedi? Are you really gonna go to that extreme? 
Twitch stream to keep up the facade? I think people believe you already. You're good, you're good. I also assume his Kuwati Signet Kyber Crystal might have been something from this collection. He also singles out an Utapan Monk Cudgel, Utapa being the planet from Revenge of the Sith, where the Grand Inquisitor originated from. There's also some armor that might be old Mandalorian Beskar armor, but I don't know. Beskar would be pretty hard to come by. There's also a Twi'lek Kalikori. This is a traditional totem carried by all Twi'lek families. There are some stone tablets that have the same symbols as the keystone that Ezra got from the Loth Wolves and Rebels. There's also some Gungan shields, you know, like the ones that Jar Jar and the other Gungans used in the Battle of Naboo and Phantom Menace. And then I think that is the helmet of the Starkiller armor from Force Unleashed. Baluthan takes her in the back to talk about another artifact. Two-faced divinity, sun goddess, and a serpent from the overworld sharing the same mouth. <laughs> yes, this stone art reflects both Luthen and Mon Mothma as people. Both of them are two-faced figures in a way. One persona in the sun, one in the underworld, but both having to speak out of the same mouth. Mon Mothma says, I found someone I think can help me. Someone who? To bring into the circle? No. Hmm, she may be referring to Bail Organa, but I would think Bail might already be part of this inner circle. Could be Bail's daughter, Leia, who would be currently working as an apprentice senator under Mon's mentorship. I don't know, maybe Mon Mothma wants to use the girl as a money mule, a way for her to move some credits back and forth. Now, the seventh member of the Aldani rebel team arrives via speeder bike. This is Lieutenant Gorn, an Imperial defector. There were men on the inside. He mentions an Imperial engineer arriving from Coruscant who might be Galen Urso. Maybe this appeared where Galen has been moved from Coruscant to Eadu and his forced Death Star super laser research. Mon Mothma's husband, Perrin, added some familiar names to the dinner party guest list. Ars Dangor Slymore from the Vizier's private chamber? Yeah, no. Ars Dangor was first mentioned in the Tarkin novel and was implied to be one of the goofy-hatted men from Palpatine's entourage in Return of the Jedi. Slymore is that creepy-looking bald and barren female aide to Palpatine first seen in Attack of the Clones and often at his side. And that chick is a force adept. You do not want to be sitting across from her at a dinner table trying to hide stuff. These are Mon Mothma's main political Folks. Well, these people are fun. Who oh, are they? Are they fun? Well, we should find some Gorman guests for tonight and see how amused they are. Your fun friends just cut off their shipping lanes yesterday. Do you know how many will starve? Ah, Gormans. Gormans are the impressed people who will fall victim to an Imperial massacre three years from now. And speaking out on it will actually make Mon Mothma have to leave the Senate, turn fugitive, and publicly head the rebellion. Back in Aldani, a model shows the dam in the valley when the Empire dammed up the Sacred River. We learned that Nemec actually made this by hand. Obviously, it's not to scale. Who is this guy? Doc Brown? Take some credit. Excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. Gorn describes this astronomical event that they're going to use as cover. Once every three years, the Aldani's gather in this valley for a celestial event, but like a curtain being pulled across the sky. Until the eye, the window to the galaxy forms over the horizon. A curtain pulled over the sky. Sounds like a classic George Lucas white bed, it doesn't it? But it's so meaningful to use this sacred mystic event as their escape path, as if the mystics who were driven from these lands can finally have a victory over the empire. In addition to the mission having practical stakes, it really just gives their mission deeper spiritual stakes. Dedra and Blevin take their case to Partagaz. Sir. It is my feeling that this is part of an ongoing effort to steal proprietary Imperial equipment in anticipation of an organized rebellion. I have three previous case files on my desk that begin to suggest a pattern. Yes, she's probably onto something, but for now, Partagast misses her concerns, yet compliments her detention numbers from Sev Tok. Sev Tok is a midrim planet mentioned in the Darth Plagueis novel. Cassian is handed a garrison map and an Aldani phrasebook with an Oribesh alphabet and corresponding Aldani letters, which she's got to learn by morning? Now, since Cassian spoke Kenari for the first decade of his life, do we really know if he can read Oribesh that well, let alone translate to Aldani? I mean, something tells me that Luthen totally lied about those three languages that Cassian could speak. I don't know, maybe I'm just reading into that Leah Michelle look on his face. Follow me on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at EA Voss. Follow New Rockstars, subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching, bye. I really love Andor because it pulls so much from Star Wars lore, like you have a ton a ton of material to pull from. Like, that's why I couldn't wait for the breakdown to try to give me a more insight on some of the planets, some of these characters. And as you can see, they're pulling from so many different Star Wars books. I love that because like I said, I used to always be that kid and you go to science fiction, you see a lot of Star Wars books. I'm a Star Wars fan, but I just told myself, I'm like, to really go into all these books, I wouldn't know where to start. Like from the Old Republic to the New Republic to what happened after Return of the Jedi, what happened in between um, Empire Strikes Back and Return. It was so much going on. And I was telling myself like, 
if we can have this in episodic fashion, I'll be thrilled. And to me, Andor is that boots on the ground. You're getting to see the rebellion form and how it took place. So you get to go to these different planets and it's opening up that Star Wars lore even more. We're doing it with the Mandalorian and now with Andor, Book of Boba kind of had a little bit, but I just love how you're just gonna, it's gonna be one huge Star Wars universe and I freaking love it. I love it. I love Lutheran. I love, you know, Stella Skarsgård as Lutheran, just, you know, that cold hearted, we really have to stick to the plan. And then when he switched over with the wig and he just said, oh, the charm, you know, I was like, you see how you can play that high society, snobby, elegant type of art dealer. So I love this. I love where this is going and I love how it's all going to make sense soon enough. So you guys enjoyed my reaction to Andor episode four, breakdown, Star Wars, Easter eggs, and details we've missed. Subscribe to my channel, subscribe to the new rock stars, post comment down below, and like the video. It's your boy, D. Dyson. Peace.